Hello, this week we're going to talk about interactive views. So before we've talked about handling complexity with the strategy of deriving new data, this came up when we were talking about data abstractions. This week we're going to talk about two more approaches for handling complexity. One is manipulating the view interactively, changing it over time, and the other is to facet across multiple views and not just have a single view. So let's dive in. With manipulating a single view, the big idea is that we could change over time, uh, and that necessarily often, but not always, involves selection. So let's start with this idea of changing over time. At some level, it's fundamentally a straightforward idea. We could change any of the other choices that we've made for visual encoding. The way we do the visual encoding itself, any sort of a parameter, um, the spatial arrangement, we could rearrange or reorder things. Um, stuff we'll talk about later on in the term, like aggregation level, what is being filtered, any of these things are possible uh, interactive changes. Essentially, interaction entails change in some deep way. Now, it's both powerful and flexible to think about interacting uh, with the view by change over time. It's in many ways the most obvious thing to do. Um, it's very frequently used. So let's think about some examples of that. So one thing you could do is change the visualization idiom. You could re-encode, change the visual encoding of your data. Certain systems make that very easy and straightforward. Typically, these are applications as opposed to programming environments. So here's an example of using Tableau, uh, where just through dragging and dropping, people can change uh, the way that the uh, visual encoding works. Uh, so here we see that um, there's been a change from looking at uh, a bar chart, uh, to stacked bars, uh, selecting a different view, now changing to a geographic view. Um, of course, when you're using a tool like D3, uh, it's not as straightforward to do that, um, but it's worth thinking about in the larger scheme of what could be changed. So what's something else we could do? We could change the parameters of what we're seeing. Um, Often one way to think about this is when there's widgets and controls, right? The visualization, uh, you know, some sort of chart, even if it's an interactive chart, might only be part of what you see on the drawing canvas. You might have widgets like sliders or buttons, radio buttons, check boxes, drop, bo drop downs, sometimes these are called combo boxes. I mean, what's really nice about having these visible controls is uh, the affordances, that is the Visual, the visual indication of what you could do are usually pretty clear, um, especially if you have things like, uh, here's an example of radio buttons where they're self-documenting because there's a label explaining what's going to happen. Um, of course, those kinds of widgets and controls, they do use screen space. Notice how on this view, only uh, a small part of it, maybe about you know half to three quarters, is actually being used for uh, visual elements themselves as opposed to widgets and other things. One design choice is these could be separated very much or they could be more interleaved in a fine-grained way between what the controls and the canvas are. So let's look at this example. Uh, this is made by D3 by uh, Lauren Wood. Um, so with this one, we've already seen a, a static view of that. Um, you know, notice how we've got some interactive controls. We can, uh, in this case, these buttons are changing the order. Uh, we can switch from looking at the county level or city level data. Uh, as we start playing the sequence, we'll see that there are, in this case, we're uh, progressing over time. Notice how we could do things like turn off the railroads. So this just gives us some sense of what kind of interaction uh, is possible with these different kinds of widgets. All right. What else could we do? Well, we could change the order of things within a fixed visual encoding. Um, right. So here's an example where 
we've got a simple table. And what we're doing is we're doing a data-driven reordering. Uh, we talked about these ideas um, when we were discussing uh, separate order and align for bar charts. Um, you know, an example of doing this would be to make it easier to find extreme values or trends. So let's actually look at this as an interactive view. Uh, this is a D3 block by my boss doc um, as an example of how to do things. And notice how in this view, we can just switch between. So we could look at this alphabetically. We could look at frequency in one direction or in another. And of course, this is D3 blocks. So if you're curious about exactly what code uh, was required to do this, it's uh, easy to take a look. Now, that was an example of one bar chart. A lot of the power of reordering is not just when you have one single chart, although that can be useful, but more complex visual encodings. Like here's an example where we're rendering a table with many attributes. Uh, and we still have this idea of reordering. But in this system, there are multiple columns, each showing a different attribute. So we've got a multi-attribute table. Um, and what this reordering is particularly good for is finding correlations between attributes. So let's take a look. This one's also made in D3. It's the data stripes. Um, we're just going to load some random data in here. And notice how, let's make this a bit bigger. So what can we do here? If we click on a column name, it's going to reorder according to that column. Now, notice how, you know, at this point, I'm just seeing, aha, column three and column five, these do appear to have pretty strong correlation. Um, and so this kind of reordering is quite powerful for just noticing through interactive exploration when you might see some correlations. Of course, now we can see here, here's some categorical variables rather than, um, here's even a Boolean example. Notice how if we sort by date, uh, we see this. So what's actually happening here, these are like bar charts that are very, very, very uh, small, just one pixel wide or one pixel high lines, um, but that allows for quite significant information density to see a lot of things uh, at once. Notice how we can see what's happening as we sort by color, then by date. We'll start to see these kind of patterns here. All right. Now, what else could we do? Well, we could change the alignment. So remember how when we talked about stack bars, we pointed out that it was quite easy to compare the lengths of that first segment, in this case, the red one, and the length of the entire bar. Um, but it was very hard to compare others. Now, you could interactively allow people to change that. Uh, here's an example from the lineup system, uh, which was one where they uh, implemented the idiom that you could simply move this triangle anywhere you like. It starts out on the far left. But when you move it, say, between the blue and the green here, notice how the entire um, chart just does a relatively subtle realignment. Um, and now we can still see two things, but these two things are the blue bars and the green bars, and they're diverging out from this common center line. So we can still see only two things, but we can pick uh, two of the intermediate segments instead of only one segment and the entire bar. Now, what's worth thinking about as we change things is how does that change occur? Um, the most obvious thing to do when you change the view is to simply abruptly change the entire view. But it can actually be very useful to have an animated transition, a smooth transition from one state to another. It's an alternative to simply doing a jump cut that really supports tracking between items. Um, and as we'll be talking about today, this is really one of the very best cases for the use of animation. Um, and sometimes you'll even want to stage that animation to make things even easier to follow. So let's look at an example of what I mean by this. We actually did already see a little bit of this, um, but let's go and dive into more detail. So what just happened here? These are changing back and forth between 
grouped bars and stacked bars. So notice how it's possible to try to follow what's happening as individual bars move um, in a way that would be a lot harder if we simply had a jump cut going back and forth between these two views. So uh, the idea that we can track individual items or objects uh, is what they're really focused on here. All right, let's take a look at another animated transition. Uh, of course, we'll be talking more about trees uh, in later videos. Um, but for this one, there's a transition uh, that's more about uh, navigation, which is something we'll see just a little bit later on today. Oh, overachieved with two tabs there. So with this one, we've got an expandable and collapsible tree. And so notice how as I expand or contract, I'm actually seeing, you know, these are very quick. The transitions are typically maybe one second or even less, depending. Um, but the core idea is that we do want some sort of mental scaffolding as we go from state to state. Um, and uh, of course, we'll see more about trees a bit later. But just to give you the idea that it's not simply about um, any particular chart type, you can do animated transitions between many different visual encodings. Let's take another look at, uh, in this case, we're going to have a hierarchical bar chart, which is we're going to go from one level of detail to another, and the transition is how we're adding that detail. So again, let's take a look. So let's see what we have here. We're actually, in this case, looking at the uh, package structure of D3 itself. Um, so notice how we have this staging, where first it sorts itself into segments, and only then does it animate those segments. So this kind of staged transitions actually does make things easier to follow, of splitting and then moving. And we can click on the background to go back and back up again. So, and this is really to help you see from view to view um, a little more of what's going on. Now, one thing to think of when we consider interaction is what physical hardware are you designing for? Because there can really be differences. For example, on a keyboard, on a, on a desktop, if you've got a mouse and a keyboard, you're often making some assumptions. You're some, assuming you usually have a fairly large screen, um, the ability to hover the mouse over something, uh, the ability maybe to have multiple clicks if you're holding down, um, either if you've got uh, multiple buttons on the mouse or that you can hold down uh, keyboard keys while you click. Um, and in contrast, on a mobile, you've got a very different kind of interaction. For one thing, your screen is often much smaller and you don't have the capability of a hover, right? You can tap on a screen, but you can't hover the same way you can do with the cursor. So that's already one sort of way that the low level interaction details are gonna control the kinds of uh, operations you can do. Um, now, this is something that particularly has been uh, a struggle with data journalists uh, who, you know, have really almost completely uh, transitioned from assuming people are on a desktop to designing first for mobile um, and then assuming in some cases people might be uh, using a desktop. Um, so this mantra we'll uh, see later on in the term, a different mantra. Uh, from Ben Schneiderman, but this is Gregor Eich's adapt adaptation of that, which is details first, no zoom and filter, and then overview on desktop only. And we'll be talking quite a lot about overviews as time goes on. Now, it's also interesting to think about some of the more exotic things. Um, you know, what about gesture-based interface? There's a very fun video um, uh, by Alex Kaufman about Tom Cruise. Those of you who've seen the movie Minority Report, where Tom Cruise is gesturing, um, you know, it, it's worth thinking about what would it be like if you were trying to use an interface like that for 
hours a day, your arms would get tired, right? There's a reason that when we're using a mouse, we can actually uh, keep our um, elbow on a desk and actually not have to hold the arms, the weight of our arms up. So there's a, a lot of trickiness to this kind of, you know, gestural interfaces when you think about just the, the ergonomics of people. Um, so, you know, fun, but probably not going to run out and uh, use that in real life anytime soon. On the other hand, uh, video is getting to be pretty cheap, ubiquitous, and powerful. Uh, and there is a lot of image processing and video processing, processing that can be used for interaction. So it's something to think about uh, what might be possible, um, particularly in the visualization context. We're not going to go deep into that in this class, but it's something for you to keep in mind for the future. Uh, another thing that's getting cheaper and cheaper and more widespread is eye tracking. Uh, of course, there's challenges um, in doing really fine grain control with that. But just keep in mind that although we're going to focus in this class on um, mostly desktop contexts, possibly some of you might want to do something that works on mobile for your final projects, although that's not required. But keep in mind that there are different modalities. So when we think about any kind of interaction, there's this really basic operation, which is selection. So many forms of interaction require some idea of the, the target, the, the subset of the data that you're going to be working on. Um, often that subset of the data is even um, one item, maybe a small number. Um, but it brings up a lot of questions like, well, how many different kinds of selections do you need to support in your system, right? We just finished talking about modalities, right? And so if you think about what's involved, if you're moving the mouse and then you click, that's actually a more heavyweight operation than if you're just ballistically moving um, the, the mouse or the, the trackpad, um, where you might have a very dynamic hover uh, that's very lightweight. But of course, that's not available on most on most touch screens. Um, do you want to support multiple kinds of clicks, right? Like shift click or option click, um, you know, on more exotic devices, uh, one's even been uh, prototyped here at UBC by Karen McLean's lab. There's this idea that you could have proximity, not just click or hover like we have with mice, uh, but some more um, fine grained sensing of, you know, how far are you from a touch screen? Uh, if you're using something that's not just built into current commercial ones. So not only do you want to think about the modalities of the interaction, but also the semantics of the application. So for example, when you select something, are you replacing what you used to have selected with the new thing? Or are you adding, you know, maybe a second or a third item to uh, the set of what's already selected? Does it make sense for the selection to be nothing at all? You know, for example, just um, a few demos ago, remember how when I clicked on the background that actually had a zoom out activity, um, right? So sometimes it's useful to be able to say, I didn't select anything, then you can have something specific happening there. In some cases, you might need primary versus secondary selection. For example, if you're working with network data where you want to think about um, nodes on each side of a link, that might be a useful way to, uh, to specify things. Um, right? You might actually need something quite um, uh, involved to keep track of group membership. Right? You might not just want to either add things to the selection set or replace them, but maybe you actually would want to explicitly take a group of things you've selected, give that a name, do something else with it. So these are some things you can think about when you're considering what kind of selections you're supporting. But there's more. So highlighting is something that I'm going to talk about as a distinction from selecting. So with highlighting, the idea is that we have some sort of change of the visual encoding for the target that you've selected. So this is an idea that's really, really closely tied to selection, but it is separable from it because we're really separating the act of selecting from the visual feedback you get that you've just selected something. Now, the reason it's useful to think about these as sort of separate uh, issues, well, for one thing, we can think about the design issues involved in how do you give that visual feedback? We're doing visualization, so we're going to think about visual channels. 
So some of the visual channels that are very frequently used to indicate selection through highlighting, you know, one is you could change the color of the item. That's actually what we've done in this little uh, schematic diagram here. Um, we've gone from black to green. Now, it's in many ways, the it's obvious people don't usually need a lot of explanation for what's going on. But of course, that does hide an existing color coding. Um, you could add an out outline mark. In fact, that's what we've done here as well. Uh, we could change the size, right? Sometimes you'll uh, make lines wider. You could change the shape. Like for example, if you've got a line, maybe you change from solid to a dashed line. So there's a lot of things you could do to visually indicate selection through highlighting. Um, there's even some of the more exotic channels like motion. Uh, usually if you've just got a single view, you would avoid that because it's such a strong perceptual cue that it, you can't really look away from it. Um, on the other hand, if you had multiple views, as we'll talk about later in this video, then you really could possibly justify that to really draw close attention to another view. If you're in one view with the cursor, you might want something to uh, be visible in some other view. All right, so we've talked about general change over time and selection, but now let's actually talk about a specific kind of changing over time it's important enough we're really going to consider it separately, which is navigation. So we'll think about zooming, panning, constrained navigation. Let's dive in. So with navigation, what we're doing is we are changing a viewpoint. So what does that mean? We're changing which items are visible within a view. And we're typically using a camera metaphor. So the idea is that we're doing some sort of panning, uh, translating, scrolling. These are all basically synonyms uh, where you're moving. Think of moving the camera either up and down or sideways compared to some scene that the camera is looking at. Um, you know, you can think of it, whether you think of it as eyes or camera, that is the, the metaphor we use. So one really common form of panning or scrolling um, in a visualization context is uh, what's called scrolly telling, like storytelling with scrolling. Um, and that's where you're just panning down. And let's actually take a look at that just to get a sense of uh, how these work. Uh, today is the day of many, many interactive demos. Um, and uh, so here's an article from Bostock uh, talking about some of the issues in scrolling. Um, and, uh, but let's actually look at a few examples of scrolly telling. Uh, this is a blog post from Robert Cassara. Um, and let's actually click through and see a few examples. One of these is the uh, influential What's Warming the World scrolly telling story. So notice what's happening here. I'm scrolling down in the mouse, and we're seeing things change. Um, and this is trying to get some sense of you know, what things might be responsible. So it's seeing, our, is it this factor? Is it that factor? So I've stopped scrolling now. And then as I continue scrolling, um, I'm going to see a it's going to basically trigger the next visualization. I could keep scrolling to trigger the next. And then we discover, you know, no, it's not, you know, orbital changes over or volcanic or solar. Uh, can see it's not deforestation. Notice if I want to jump back, I can jump back to a previous one. These are actually these uh, little visual indications. And so we're going to see it's not aerosol. And the one factor that really does correlate here is the greenhouse gases. Um, so now that you've seen an example of this, what, what are some of the pros and cons? So it's certainly familiar and intuitive because normal web browsing where you're actually just reading text, of course, you scroll down to uh, see further down in the browser window. So doesn't need much explaining. Um, and one other nice thing about it is it is linear. Your, your choices are up and down. Um, whereas if you're allowed to click anywhere in an interface, uh, as we did in some of the um, 
previous demos I showed you, well, you know, you could have many choices. You don't necessarily know, should I click up here or over there or over here? There are some cons. Um, if you're in the full screen mode, it might not be obvious that you need to scroll. Notice how here they actually have very specific directions saying, you know, scroll to start an animation uh, because they can't necessarily assume that you even know that scrolling will do any good. Right? We've seen a lot of static visualization. So how do you know when something is static versus interactive? Uh, what they sometimes call scroll jacking um, is that you don't necessarily have direct access to um, being able to control. The one we just saw actually had a control panel on the right. Um, but uh, sometimes you can get trapped uh, within the scroll. Um, it might not be quite the behavior you expect, especially if you get right on the boundary between. It can sometimes be hard to keep track. And fundamentally, these are screenfuls, but you've got this continuous control. So a discrete step of a screenful versus the continuous control can sometimes lead to some confusion. We've already looked at the Bloomberg graphics. Let's take a quick look at another example of scrolly telling. Uh, this one from the New York Times um, on uh, oil prices. So here's another example of something where as I scroll down, which is what I'm doing here, notice how the um, there'll be often some sort of textual explanation. And then as I scroll, there's actually an animated transition from one thing to the next. Uh, so that's where they showed monthly as opposed to yearly. So dived in to see more detail. Now changing uh, the axes. And then, but recently things have shifted. So as we scroll, we're sort of seeing this story unfold. Um, it doesn't have to be the case that there are animated transitions, although that's very frequently the case because they are so much easier to track. All right, so I think you've seen enough of this to get a sense of what that interaction feels like. All right, so let's think about some of the issues that are involved in navigation. So we've already talked about panning or scrolling, that is moving up and down or even moving sideways. Now, when would you rotate something around or spin it around? That's not very common in 2D, but it's extremely common in 3D. So if we were ever actually looking at something in 3D, we would often just want to spin it around to see it from different angles. Uh, we're really not going to focus on that in this class, uh, so I'm not going to talk much more about it. But I will talk about zooming. So let's think about what's involved in zooming, where you're basically enlarging or shrinking the world as if there's a camera either moving closer to something or further away from it. And um, let's, for today, just uh, talk about this idea of a geometric zoom, which is just like if you were actually moving a physical camera. Um, that is the standard thing you're doing. Um, and so now one thing you might consider is how does the user control the zoom? So the easiest one to think about as the designer, the programmer of a system is just unconstrained navigation, right? Where you say, well, I give you controls, right? You can move this way or that way. You can move up or down. You can zoom in, you can zoom out. Now, although that's very easy to implement, it can actually lead to some difficulties for the user. It can be really easy to maybe zoom too far in or zoom too far back and have things too small to be seen or have them go out of the, view, uh, the viewport completely. Um, I mean, the thing to think about is we're not, and, and it gets even worse when it's 3D motion instead of 2D motion. Um, in general, people are not born knowing how to be helicopter pilots, right? They require a lot of training uh, to do a good job of moving, particularly in 3D. Um, so something that uh, visualization designers will do a lot is to use constrained navigation. Um, and typically, this is using animated transitions as the means to the end of constrained navigation. And what you'll do is you'll select something that's interesting to you, and then the system will automatically compute a camera trajectory that ends up moving the view continuously from where it started to something where what you have picked is very clearly and nicely framed in the view. Let's look at some examples of that. 
Uh, most of these are D3 blocks. Uh, so here's an example of a geographic map where there's going to be quite a simple zoom. Um, and uh, this is actually particularly for showing people how to, let's grab, so notice how we can zoom from one state to the other. Now this is, in fact, a moment ago what I was doing was unconstrained navigation, where I'm just sort of using the, the uh, well, a little confusing here. I'm just using the scroll wheel on the mouse. Um, and now I'm just doing um, panning. But then as soon as I actually click in a state, then we see that um, that change. So here I'm going to click on main. We're going to zoom all the way in and then zoom all the way back. Notice how that was easier. I didn't ever overshoot, whereas if I wanted to explicitly find main, right, I'm going to have to scooch over and then go in. Uh, and then when I zoom out, it's like, oh, wait, the US is now going out of the uh, frame. Uh, whereas if I just click on a state, then that navigation is automatically computed. All right, now here's an example of a, a slightly different transition. Uh, we'll talk more about icicle plots later uh, when we get to the section on trees, but just as an example of something that looks a little bit different, we're gonna see that the transition into a mark is actually gonna cause the aspect ratio, that is the shape uh, of things to change. So let's take a look at that one. All right, so let's try, notice how, I mean, it's going rather quickly, but we can uh, click in the left column to zoom out. Nope, that's not what I wanted. So, and when we zoom in, we're actually seeing more data appear here on the right. Um, So what used to be not visible is now visible. OK, so let's think about some of the pros and cons of interaction. Now, interaction is a very, very powerful thing. It's one of the main advantages of actually using a computer rather than, say, you know, trying to do things on paper. So it's a really major advantage. It's flexible, it's powerful, it's very intuitive. Um, it's particularly used in contexts like exploratory data analysis, where often you're doing changes as you go through an analysis process. Um, and it can be really nice, especially in contexts where you want to really fluidly switch between a lot of tasks. Different visual encodings do support different tasks, as we've already talked about a bit and we will continue talking about. Um, so just being able to move between the different encodings can really help you do things more flexibly. Um, this idea of animated transitions that we've seen several examples of now, that really does provide very good support for keeping track of how the items are either moving to different positions uh, or you're getting more items in the view. Um, people have done empirical studies and it, there's some substantial evidence that shows that these really do help people stay oriented. But it's not perfect. What are some of the challenges about interaction? Well, a major issue is that there is a time cost. It actually takes the human time to go through and interact with things. And sometimes that cost is minor, but sometimes it's actually quite significant. And in the very worst case, interaction can just devolve into you know, human powered search. If you have to go through a whole interface and go click, click to try to find you know, where things are, um, that can actually be quite uh, laborious. So keep in mind that it is a double-edged sword. Um, another issue with interaction is that remembering what you saw before actually does impose a cognitive load. Remember, our goal of, with visualization is to sort of offload cognition for perception. Um, and to really use your eyes looking at something rather than forcing you to use internal mental resources. So we're going to be seeing a few examples of ways in which needing to remember some previous state does in fact impose some load in addition to the time cost. <laughs> 
uh, controls might actually start using up some of the screen. Remember that we care about information density, that is how densely we're using, um, we're actually communicating information about the data uh, as opposed to just uh, having a very uh, non-dense white space. Uh, so that could be an issue. And if you don't have the controls take up screen real estate, then you might have a situation where invisible functionality, because you don't have any visible controls, might actually be very difficult to discover. Uh, so discoverability can often be a big concern. Um, affordances is the uh, human computer interaction word uh, for that ability to signal what kind of uh, controls are actually uh, available in an interface. Um, and the really important thing to keep in mind is you might want them to interact, you the designer of the visualization, but it's up to the user to decide whether or not they will in fact interact. Um, and there's some you know, sobering statistics from data journalism, uh, again, Gregor Eich, um, uh, pointed out in a talk a few years ago that their logs show that about 90% of the people do not do interaction beyond just that very simple form of scrolly telling. Uh, so it can be a challenge to get people to interact. Of course, the 10% that do can do some really interesting things. All right, so we've talked about a bunch of ideas of how if we have a single view, we could have that view change over time. We could have it interactively change. But now let's switch gears and talk about, well, what if you want to have more than one view, more than one you know, chart at once? So let's talk about some of the design considerations for that. So when we talk about faceting into multiple views, uh, we're going to talk about three major issues, juxtaposing views side by side, how do we partition between views, and how might we superimpose two views on top of each other. So let's start with juxtaposing. All right, so juxtapose, that's just a big word for put things side by side, um, is a uh, a thing we could do with views, and often when we juxtapose views side by side, we really want to think about how do we coordinate between the views. That's what gives you the real power. So we'll talk about whether the visual encoding of the views is shared across the views. Is it the same or is it different? And we'll talk quite a bit about linked highlighting. How do you have highlighting that is linked between views? Um, if you have multiple views, what do we see with the data? Is all of the data shared between the views or a subset of the items shared or are none of the items shared between the views? And then also this idea that views could really share navigation. So let's walk through some examples. We're going to start out with this idea of linked highlighting. This is a fundamental idea that's going to be just pervasive in interactive visualization. And what we want to know is if we've got one view and we select a region in that one view, what happens in the other views? So especially is some region that's contiguous in one view, is it distributed in the other view or is it also close together? So let's look at this example uh, from uh, the EDB system. Uh, in this case, we're looking at some baseball statistics. Okay, so what can we immediately see? Well, we see that the visual encoding is different. Um, a term for this is multi-form. Um, you know, notice how, well, what have we got? We've got this bar chart of the number of years the baseball players had been playing. We see a log scale view of their salary. Uh, we see what position they're playing in. And then we see a few scatter plots. So, you know, these are multiple visual encodings. They're not all identical. It's not all bar charts. Um, and what are we noticing? We're, we're seeing, well, all of the items are actually shared between the views. Each, you know, in these views, each dot is a baseball player. Um, and so there's this idea that all of the baseball players are shown in all of the views, but what's different between them is different attributes, right? Here are two scatter plots um, that are showing, you know, this one is assists versus putouts. This one is how many uh, hits per year. Um, and so, and that what we've done here, in this case, they've selected some people at the uh, top end of the salary range. And then the question is, the people that get paid a lot of money, what characteristics do they have? We can see they're spread out in seniority, and they're spread out in positions, and they're 
spread out in terms of the assists and the putouts, but they're not as spread out. We see that actually all the really high paid players are the ones that are on the top half of the number of hits per year. So we are seeing this correlation between the one view and the other view. Um, so that's the kind of thing you can see with linked highlighting. I'll mention sometimes when you see people talk about linked highlighting, they'll use the phrase brushing and linking uh, is uh, a synonym for, um, so the word brushing is sometimes used instead of linked highlighting. Now, with linked views, there's this question of the directionality. So is it just unidirectional or is it bidirectional? It is almost always better to be bidirectionally linked unless you have a very good design reason not to. Uh, let's look at uh, an example of this to understand uh, what that's going to look like. Um, so here we've got an example of uh, some geographic data on one view. Uh, we'll go ahead and have that translate. Um, come on. Ah, did this demo stop working? Apparently it did. Okay, so much for that uh, demonstration. Now let me go directly to the more interesting one, which is actually the bidirectionally linked view. Um, so the previous one uh, was going to be an example of how uh, there was a leader view and then the other views just followed it. This one's uh, the more interesting case where we're looking at something bidirectional. Notice how as I move my mouse over the line chart, then I see this uh, dot appear. It's actually just grabbing the, the nearest location on the line. And notice how in this view down below, where I'm actually seeing a semicircular arc appear. Now, it works the other direction too. In this view, as I move the mouse and see a semicircular arc, now I'm driving the dot at the top. So this is an example of a bidirectionally linked view where either side can drive the other. Um, now, of course, you have to think when you're implementing these about how it works so that you don't just get this sort of infinite loop where if you've got something in one view, then you wanna go draw it in the other view. Uh, and you do have to architect your software with a little bit of care to make sure that you in fact then bottom out and stop rather than keep bouncing back and forth updating forever. So here's a nice example of a more complex um, multi-directional linking, right? Here's a system, this is actually a class project a number of years ago uh, from UBC, uh, from Peter Bishai, he ended up going off to work for the NBA after this. Um, and uh, let's actually play that one again. Notice how as the mouse moves in one view, then all these other views are updating. So you could drive it from one of these bar charts or the vertical or the vertical line chart, the sideways bar chart, and notice how, um, or uh, actually this view of the baseball shots as another view. So, oops, let me go back to there. Um, let's actually quickly take a look at that. Um, so notice how when I move the mouse in one view, um, I can see some things happening, but then notice how when I move in these other views, uh, a number of things are happening, right? I've actually got this, uh, um, the line on the nearest line is actually updating across the views. Notice how as I move side by side in these top views, I'm actually seeing something move up and down uh, in these bottom views. Um, and then I'm also seeing a semicircular line. Uh, this and the previous demo are actually by the same person, uh, Peter Bishai, uh, and that component was just a sort of simple version um, that he then later used in uh, this one. So if people are curious, they can play uh, later on, but that gives you some sense. Uh, he also has a nice uh, uh, technical blog post about some of the ways to do linked highlighting at scale. Okay, what are some other things we can do? Well, there's an idea of overview versus detail views. So in this one, uh, and this can actually be, uh, it's a very um, general 
uh, approach. It could be either the same encoding or different encodings. And this example we see on the screen here of a geographic one, we've got the same visual encoding. They're both map views. Um, and this idea of having a bird's eye map, you've probably seen in a lot of uh, different navigation systems. This is actually, this was an older version. Google Maps doesn't uh, do this by default anymore. Um, but what's going on here? A subset of the data in one view is seen in the other view. In this one, we've actually got um, the zoomed way out view is of all of New Zealand is the little one. And then there's this detail view. Um, where we're only seeing a subset of it, but we're seeing that in a lot more detail, uh, right? We can't actually see the cities in the overview, but we can see them here. And there's shared navigation as you move in one view. For example, if you move around in the detail, you'll see the little box in the overview showing the extent of the viewport is gonna update and vice versa. You could drag in uh, the bird's eye view and then that would update the view in the detail view. In this particular case, we're seeing you know, two different sized windows, um, big detail and small overview. It could be the other way. Sometimes it's large overview um, and then smaller detail view uh, or they're equal sized. And this is not specific to the same encoding Let's uh, or to um, geographic encodings. Let's take a look at uh, another example. Um, in this one, and this one's a D3 block, so that you can uh, go and see what's happening there. Um, and in this one, we also have this idea that there is some shared subset. Um, and in this case, it's de deliberately unidirectional linking, where there's a small overview that you use to select, and then a large detail view where you can actually uh, change the extent of that. So let's take a look here. Um, so notice how in this view on the bottom, this is basically, it's the overview and it's also the controller view. And then I can make this, you know, by making that window smaller, that means I'm zooming in more. I can drag it around and then let's zoom out a little bit with this control here. Um, and so notice how this is, you know, this view doesn't control that one. So the, the detail view is not controlled. Um, by the overview, it's the overview that's controlling the detail view. So sometimes it is legitimate to have unidirectional if you there really is this asymmetry of, of control. In other cases where it's more of a symmetric thing, then you might in fact uh, want both views to bidirectionally influence each other. Okay, so Another thing that's worth having a look at is this idea of a tooltip. Um, now, most of you are probably familiar with this as an idea, but let's think about what this is from an analysis point of view. Um, so if there is a more detailed, uh, small amount of information that you want to provide, then a pop-up tooltip is something where you can give more information about some selected items. It can happen on hover, it can happen on click. And this is a very specific kind of detail view. It's typically quite small. Um, it pops up where the cursor is. Um, so it is showing more details on demand. Now, you do have to be aware of a couple things. One is it usually occludes, right? It's in front of the other stuff in the view. Uh, let's actually just quickly take a look at this. So you've got a mental picture as we're talking through the pros and cons of it. Uh, this is actually a tool called High Charts, not D3. Um, so this is a very similar thing to what we saw with that D3 block. But what's also here is notice that when we put the mouse here, we're seeing a tooltip that pops up uh, based on, and this is all hover rather than click. So it's notice how it's very quick and fluid. Um, so you know, and we're able to see, okay, US to European dollar, we see the date, we see the exact number. So this is an example of a useful thing to do. You know, sometimes you actually don't, you know, what's great about a line chart is you get this sort of overall trend picture, you see overviews, but if you actually need to know the precise number, well, then it's very handy to be able to actually say, get the number out of that tooltip. However, be very, very careful. Um, especially when you are thinking about your final projects. Many of you are going to be tempted to do too much work, 
with the tooltip. So tooltips are typically something where you are reading information in this little window. Now remember when you're reading things that's not using the perceptual system. So be aware of the fact that first of all, you're typically not using perception, you're using cognition with a tooltip. But even more crucially, you don't have an overview, right? Notice how in this case, it's reasonably used. We have the overview, which is that the spatial position of the line is actually telling you something. You're able to see a lot at once. If the only way you have to see a particular attribute is through a tooltip, then you know, you'd actually have to go check, if you have to go checking in many, 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 many places and remembering what it said, that's not really using perception at the level we'd like to. Again, uh, more advice from the New York Times. Um, if you make a rollover or a tooltip, assume nobody will see it. If it's important, make it explicit. So I'm not saying don't use tooltips. There are good situations for using them, but be aware that they are not uh, going to take most of the perceptual burden. Uh, so always think, can I visually encode something? When to do visually encode something versus show details in a tooltip. So another idiom is what's called small multiples. Now with small multiples, that is small multiple views, um, you're going to use the same visual encoding across all the views. In this particular example, we're using line charts, but it could be anything. And the idea is that none of the data is shared between the views. So think of this as different slices of the data set. Um, usually it's items, although depending on how you think about it, it could also be attributes. But the key thing is you're seeing, um, like in this example, we're looking at stock prices for different companies. And so, you know, what's important, um, you can think about, is it useful to align the views themselves? Notice how these views are all aligned so that they have a shared horizontal axis, which is actually time, so that you can make comparisons. Um, you know, in this one, we see this actually predated Google's IPO. Then here's when Google actually went public. So there was a stock price. Um, so what you get from small multiples is, well, the ability to compare things side by side and have your eyes move very quickly and easily between the views. Um, you know, part of the word small is sort of implying that, you know, these are not taking the entire screen. Uh, notice how in this one, we're not even seeing uh, axes uh, or tick marks. We're really focused on large scale comparisons rather than uh, a detailed uh, understanding of any single one of these charts. Um, now, keep in mind that of course, with all of these approaches, you can always combine them. It's not that you either have details on demand or you have small multiples. Here's a nice example of combining both of these. Let's actually jump to that chart. Uh, this is actually accompanied by a detailed blog post that talks about uh, building this in D3 and uh, what some of the issues are in building. Um, so what are we seeing here? It's uh, carbon dioxide emissions um, by year from, uh, a bunch of uh, top ones. And what I want you to notice is when I click on one of these, then it's going to zoom in. We're going to see the detail view that actually lets us, um, you know, notice how a few things that are happening here. When I move the mouse from bar to bar, instead of having a pop up tooltip uh, that's tracking the mouse, it's actually being displayed up here just below uh, the year. Um, and then you know, now we're actually seeing the labels inside, we're seeing the numbers themselves. And then if I click on the background that zooms out, notice how we had animated transitions, right? Where we went from that overview and it actually zoomed in. Now we see the detail view. So this is an example of kind of trying to have the best of both worlds to see the ability of um, these multiple, uh, you know, many small ones side by side. Uh, but also when we wanted to then zoom in and see the details. Um, and now just to see in a little more detail uh, with the small multiples, again, there's a, a few nice uh, blog posts that go into detail about uh, the, the D3 architecture underlying it. What I want to get into today, though, um, is this idea of 
what does it mean to do linked highlighting with small multiples? When we did linked highlighting with that example from baseball, we picked things in one view and wondered if they were contiguous in another. That was where we had all the items visible across views, but the visual encoding in terms of attributes was different. It's a little bit different here, depending on how we want to think about it. Um, you know, we can think of this as sort of a, a multi-dimensional table uh, where we have, in this case, it was uh, meta filter posts. And so we're seeing number of posts on the vertical axis um, uh, and for each different topic as time goes along, um, we're seeing the volume of posts. Let's actually click through and uh, take a look at, uh, let's do this demo. Um, right, and what I want you to notice is as I move the mouse in one view, then this date is actually highlighted across all of the views. So this, um, that is what we see in terms of linked highlighting, which is the one, the, the analogous spot uh, across these is being uh, highlighted. Now, of course, you know, notice how here it's 861 and then over there it's 890. It's not the same item. It's the analogous item in terms of time. All right. So what are some of the trade-offs about juxtaposing? Well, the thing to remember is there is a cost and that cost is pixels. The display area that is available to you decreases every time you add a new view, which you know at some level is sort of obvious, but the implications of it are important, right? You know, imagine a situation where you have one view versus two views side by side. Well, now, you know, each of the original might have only half the area of the single view. Um, so, you know, and this is why these are really very different approaches. If you have a single, you know, zoomable or interactive view, every time you move the mouse, you update the view, you move the mouse a little more, you update the view, right? So you might, you know, very quickly have, you know, dozens, hundreds of screen refreshes. Um, so, you know, you might see over the course of a five minute session, you might see a thousand different versions of that view. Of course, each one is quite similar to the other as it's a progression. Um, you will never do that with a juxtaposed view. You, you think long and hard and carefully about when to add another view. That's not something you do lightly. So these really have these different strengths. Um, but it is worth thinking about the benefits of juxtaposition in terms of, we can go back to this idea of cognitive load. We're gonna come back to this many times in this class of, when is your eyes doing the work versus the inside of your head doing the work? And in particular, it is lower cognitive load to move your eyes between views than it is to look at a view that's changing over time, look at what it looks like now, and then remember what it used to look like before. Comparing the memory of what you saw before to what you actually see now is a high cognitive load operation. And so that's where we start to see some of the uh, advantages and disadvantages of these different approaches to handling complexity. Let's look at another example. Here is a example where we're looking at, it's actually only eight frames of an animation and it's incredibly hard to follow what's going on. Like, okay, let's take this one here. Okay, light green, dark green, yellow, light green, dark green. I was sort of able to follow what happened with this one node, but every other node in this view is changing. They're all changing colors. It's incredibly hard to keep track. So, you know, the problem here is that things are changing all over. And if you focus on one, you can't really notice the other. Remember that we talked about change blindness before. You have really limited attentional um, resources. So it's quite hard to follow this. Um, so, and we didn't see this problem so much with the animated transitions because the amount of change was sort of carefully designed, uh, whereas this is change can happen anywhere. So let's compare, right? If we actually see, I'll stop this here so we uh, can attend to it. You know, you've actually seen this picture before. This was something where we were looking at um, 
This is actually the same layout of a bunch of nodes that represent genes. And then what's changing is the experimental conditions is causing the color coding to change. Um, so this is an example where um, you know one attribute uh, is changing um, across in terms of um, you can either think of an attribute changing or an item changing. Uh, what this really is is there's two different keys. So the gene is fixed, but the experimental condition is uh, the one that's changing. You can uh, it's probably most useful to think about that as uh, looking up a different value. But the key thing is you can notice by just moving your eyes between these views in a way that is low cognitive load compared to trying to remember what you saw seven frames ago, uh, right? I can just move my eyes from here to there and say, oh, it looks like these two red dots, yep, they're still red here. So you're able to make those uh, um, inferences a lot more easily. Okay, so we've talked through some of the design choices that are involved in view coordination. And notice how if you sort of think about these possibilities of whether the visual encoding is the same or different and whether you're seeing all the data at once or only a subset with these overview and detail, um, and you can either have the same visual encoding or different multiform visual encodings, or if you don't have any of the same data between the views, but you've got the same visual encoding, you know, we really have these four cases that are interesting. And there's two cases that are not interesting. If the encoding's the same and the data is all the same, well, these are just redundant, right? That's not very interesting. And then the flip one is if the encoding's different and none of the data is shared, well, there's no way to link them, right? So linkage requires you have to have some connection between the views. Now, let me just add a few more things before we leave the topic of multiple of uh, multiple views. One is this idea of list views, right? So we saw earlier today, there was this idea of reordering according to a list. Um, lists are particularly useful when you have relatively complex multiple view systems. And what it lets you do is it lets you look things up, right? Here's an example of, We've got you know, various geographic and parallel coordinates and scatter plot views. And if we know the name of a city, we could just go to the list view where the city name is, click on that, and then see where it falls in the other views. Either you might not know where it is geographically, or you might not know where it is on the scatter plot, because of course, how would you? So it can really be a way to use these for lookup it would be very boring to just have a list of cities if that was the only view you had. It's when you connect it up to other linked views that you see a lot of the power of that. Now, the complexity of this uh, visualization, this is from the improvised system from a number of years ago. This actually was really trying to push the uh, limits of what you could do with the multiple view system in terms of the complexity. Now, how many views is too many and how many is enough? That's actually not very well known. It's still a really open research question. Um, so it's a judgment call about how many views you can usefully hook up to each other. Um, you know, for your final projects, you'll be doing, uh, you know, you, you, you will need to do multiple views, not just a single view, um, but there'll be the judgment call of how many views uh, actually make sense for the problem you're trying to solve. All right, so we've talked about this idea of side-by-side -side views and how we juxtapose, but now let's attack the question of how do you decide what to put in which view? How do we partition? So partitioning into views um, is typically done according to, in the case where you have something like a multi-attribute table, you can split into different regions according to these attributes. And well, what are you doing when, when you do that? What you're doing is you're encoding association between items using spatial proximity. The things that are together in one view are, are always gonna be perceived as being related to each other, as being grouped compared to the ones that are in different views. So the order that you choose to split things by attribute is gonna have really, really major implications for which patterns are visible. So let's let's go through some examples. Here's a couple of D3 blocks for 
looking at bar charts. And on the left, we see grouped bar charts. So what, you know, let's analyze, well, what's a grouped bar chart? Um, well, first, so we've got this data set. It's actually one where we've got um, population. Uh, this is a US data set. So you can, one of the attributes is the state and one of the attributes is the demographics, right? The range, uh, demographic category, people by age. Okay, so what could we do? Well, let's imagine that first we split by state. And now we have one region for each state. And we're just actually seeing like six of these here, California and New York. And so we start by splitting into regions. And then what we decide is, okay, we're gonna have not just a single mark, but a more complex glyph. So within the region, we're gonna have some glyph which is made of multiple bars showing all the ages at once. And now let's think about what's easy and hard. It's really easy to compare within the state, right? We immediately notice, oh, wow, there's this big spike here um, for, you know, sort of middle-aged people uh, compared to the young and the old. Um, and we can also notice, and this pattern of, you know, sort of a little baby boom with the five to 13s and then down uh, and then much higher and then down for the elderly, that pattern is repeated across all the states. The total number of people is different, but it's a pretty strong uh, repeating pattern across pretty much all these states. So that's easy to see. What about this other one on the right? What have we done here? Well, we actually have multiple different bar charts. In fact, we can think of these as small multiples. What have we done? We for, in this case on the right, we first split by age. And that gave us one bar chart per region. Um, and now what we can do is see, we can say, oh, it's really easy to see you know, all the old people, all the middle-aged people, all the younger people. And we can really easily notice the trends here. Um, it's harder to compare across the states. It's not impossible, just like it's not impossible to compare the height of these gray bars uh, on the left but it's more difficult, it's easier to notice things within the same chart. So that's a simple example with bar charts. Let's look at a more interesting and complex example uh, where we're gonna do some um, more involved partitioning. And uh, this is a fun data set of uh, house, um, of real estate sales in the city of London in the UK. So what have they done here? They started splitting by neighborhood. I don't know how many of you have memorized your London geography bits, but here are a bunch of London neighborhoods like Bexley and Barking and Newham. So first they split by neighborhood, then within each neighborhood they've split by type. So there's flats, terraced housing, semi-detached housing, and then fully detached uh, separate houses. And then within each of those, each a row is a year and each column is a month. So you're seeing actually this really fine grained data uh, over many years. And then what they've done is they've color coded by the price of the house. Okay, so what can we see? We immediately are seeing patterns about neighborhoods, right? We can notice, wow, the rich people live in the middle of the city. Uh, things are less expensive as we get more towards the outside. Uh, we can notice some places are just, um, relatively uniform uh, between these different kinds of houses, whereas in some neighborhoods, there's a real significant difference um, in prices between, say, uh, separate detached houses or uh, apartment flats. So, okay, we could see this. What if we picked a different order for splitting? Well, here is basically almost the same data set, but first we split by the type of housing. And then within each of those housing types, we split by neighborhood. And we actually are color coding a slightly different variable. In this case, it's the variation of price, not the absolute price. Okay, well, what can we see here? We see different kinds of patterns. What really jumps out at us here is no longer exactly the neighborhood level, but thinking about for these different house types, you know, in which neighborhood is there a lot of inconsistency? Um, you know, if you found a place you like, should you grab it and go for it? Or should you keep looking because maybe there's a lot of variability in prices, so you might actually find a better deal. Um, that's the kind of thing that can pop out at you from this visualization.
Now, you know, we've just seen a bunch of examples that are very rectilinear. It doesn't have to be, you know, here's an example of the same idea where instead of uh, looking at a bunch of little boxes, they've actually used geographic maps uh, color coded. Uh, we'll talk more about those actually next week when we talk about maps. Uh, but just to give you some sense that this kind of subdivision is not specific to rectilinear visual encodings. Okay, one last idea to get through. Uh, let's talk about superimposing. So what's that all about? Well, layers, you can just think of a layer as, you know, you've got some region of space and you've got a bunch of objects and somehow you've got visually distinguishable groups and you might want to actually put them on top of each other. So across an entire view. So rather than views side by side, you're thinking about views on top of each other. The design choices that are involved with this are things like, well, how many layers can you usefully have? How can you visually distinguish between them? Um, typically what you want to do to distinguish them is make sure that you're visually encoding with some sort of either the channels themselves are non-overlapping or you know, sort of regions within those channels don't overlap. Now with static layers, two is very achievable. And if you're careful, you can often get away with three. Um, but if you do something that's interactive and dynamic, there's many more possibilities. So let's look at some examples. It's very classic uh, to do visual layering with cartographic data. Here's a map example. Um, where there's sort of conceptually two layers. There's a foreground and a background. And the foreground layer here is the roads, right? These are, um, you know, kind of brightly jumping out at you, you right? We see the highways. And they really um, have a lot of contrast with this background where you've got these sort of pale pastel um, unsaturated uh, colors. And, you know, you can tell if you want to, you can notice, well, what's water and what's land and what's parks, but it doesn't jump out at you um, because it's carefully designed to be more background instead of foreground. And that what that lets you do is the user can decide, do they want to focus on the roads or do they want to focus on uh, this uh, background information about, um, you know, where is it water and where is it land? Let's look at a more abstract example, um, an approach called trellis plots is uh, doing something a bit more complicated. Uh, what we're doing is we are looking at, in this case, it's barley yields. This is actually farming data from the 1930s. And so what's going on here? So on the, we have two years, I guess 1931 and 1932. And then the first level of split is so we partition where we split by the site that things got planted. And so, you know, Wasika versus Crookston, Morris, Duluth, these are actually cities in the Midwest. And so each one of these is a location where stuff got planted. And then along here on these rows, these are different varieties of barley. You know, there's number 38, there's number 475. And so then what they've done is they've color coded by the year. And the key thing that makes this useful is they're actually doing what's called, uh, this is a statistical technique of main effects ordering. So what they've done is they've derived the value of the median for each group of things. And then they use that. They ordered the rows within the view according to the median of the variety. And then the views themselves, right, Wasika versus Crookston versus Morris, these are ordered by the median of the entire site. And that's how we're actually able to see this pattern going from Grand Rapids through Wasika. Um, and a thing to notice is this data was very, very well known and had been really well studied. And what they noticed when they did these trellis views is, hey, wait, it's always pink on the right and blue on the left, except in this case in Morris. And they actually conjectured that there might have been a data entry problem where maybe something got flipped. Either there was a data entry problem or there truly was something very different happening in Morris. Um, either way, that's something you'd want to understand and know. And that is something that became obvious um, 
essentially because of this uh, sort of careful statistically derived ordering of things. Um, and the key thing to notice is that the blue and the pink are in the same frame. And so that you can really notice, you know, when they are directly on top of each other and the subtle nuances of their positioning. You know, if these were side by side, uh, some things might be easier to see, but exactly what's happening with, you know, things like this amount of overlap that this pink one really is to the right and the blue one is to the left, that would be harder if they were separated views side by side. So, you know, we do see some, you know, this is the combination again of partitioning and uh, superimposing, just like we could see the combination of small multiples and details on demand. So in general, a lot of these idioms are often combined with each other. So these approaches are not uh, mutually exclusive. So how far can we go? Well, I said you could only do a few layers, but if all you have is a line, well, you can do more. Maybe you can do up to say, you know, even a few dozen lines. But what we can see over here on the right is at some point, even if it's just lines instead of, you know, rich complexity of like, you know, water versus land, you can't keep going forever. Like once you start getting hundreds of lines, all you can see is the outliers, just a few outliers, and then sort of the main trend. You can't really see the details anymore. So there's really a limit as to how many layers you can see at once. Now, people have thought about this question of, well, what should you do? When should you superimpose things in the same view versus juxtapose across different views? So what we see here are the stimuli used in an, an empirical study where they were comparing these two. Notice how you really have to be careful to make it a fair comparison all of the small multiples should fit in the same space as that single superimposed chart because that's exactly the trade-off is you know how many pixel you pixels you're using for things what they found in this case was superimposed works fairly well for a small number of uh, line charts when the task only involves looking at things in a very local way, things kind of in the same spatial region. As the tasks got more global, that is looking at one part and then another part, and the number of charts increased, uh, then you actually got more power from the juxtaposed views. Now, I said this idea that, but views, you know, layered views don't have to be static. They could be interactive. They could be based on the selection. So let's look at a couple examples of highlighting one hop neighbors in a node link graph. So let's start out with one demo um, where it is a relatively heavyweight thing. Um, and what we're going to see is that we look at the neighbors when we actually click the mouse. Um, this is a node link graph that's actually so dense they're not um, you know, right now what's happening is it's just showing the label of what's under the mouse when I'm hovering, but then when I click, then it's actually showing um, all of the neighbors. In this case, this is a uh, relationship between philosophers uh, in terms of who influenced whom. So let's take a look at uh, Descartes. Um, so I can update this one hop neighborhood just every time I click the mouse. Um, Notice how then what's in the foreground is very visible. What's in the background is much um, less bright. Uh, so that's an example of visual layering. Now, what else could we do? Uh, here's an example of a D3 block where, and again, we're just seeing the nodes for now. And then as soon as I move the mouse, this is actually, I'm not clicking, I'm just ballistically moving. So because this is just drawing these on hover. Uh, so notice how this is a much more fluid feeling, uh, but it's the same basic idea. It's taking a node, uh, here we see Minneapolis, a big hub. And uh, in fact, that's where I grew up. Uh, and uh, we're seeing all those one hop neighbors. So again, this idea that it's completely dynamic just based on moving the mouse. And so in that case, we're really able to see many, many, many possibilities. It's not just two, it's this dynamic thing. So it's very different territory. Okay, so we have now just walked through um, this idea of manipulating a single view and faceting multiple views. Uh, and that is where we're gonna stop for today. And we'll move on to some of the others in the future.